Consciousness is a dream that I pursue. Comme les angles à l'œil fauve, je vendrai dans ton accord, et vers toi glisserai sans bruit, avec les hommes de la nuit. He fumbles at your spirit as players at the keys, before they drop full music on. He stuns you. Sante sang with a diwan, tros and kisiyan. Fakilas descansu sabrin. Noctes atque dies patin atre yon yodis. Sed re wakare grano superasco. Fathom five, thy father lies. Of his bones are coral made. Those are pearls that were his eyes. Nothing of him. Come, sealing night. Scarf up the tender eye of pitiful day. Light thickens and the crow makes wing to the rookie wood. Good things of day begin to droop and drowse, whilst night's black agents to their praise do rouse. Thou marvelst at my words. But hold me still. This is Twilight on the Western Door. Sator, Aripo, Tenet, Opera, Rotas. Consciousness. This is Mason Winfield, the host of Twilight on the Western Door, a program of discussions and interviews with cutting-edge experts in subjects of the supernatural, the spiritual, and the paranormal. From the cutting edge to the, to the roots of the understanding, this is Twilight on the Western Door. Our next guest is not the first to see patterns, energy, spirituality, and maybe even personality in the inanimate natural landscape. From the megalithic cultures creating rock and earth monument complexes like Karnak in France and the Newark Earthworks in Ohio, to the urbanized ancients creating capital cities like Alexandria in Egypt and Teotihuacan in Mexico, to the more recent revivals of occult landscape design, such as that perpetuated at Versailles in France and many a private manorial garden, and even individual landscape artists closer to the present, like Pierre L'Enfant in Washington, D.C., Joseph Ellicott in Buffalo, New York, and Frederick Law Olmsted wherever he worked. Our next guest, though, is one of a handful of people who suspect that perhaps the natural landscape of one of our most important and historic states could have a meaning all of its own. David Yarrow is one of those odd polymaths, a heartbeat away from both genius and international fame. David morphs a variety of diverse insight systems into his own big picture. But David's quite unique imagination sees the landscape and natural features of New York State as a big imprint upon the earth, which he, in his own original way, interprets. David is not the first to look at things in this general pattern. To add a few more, the Iroquois Confederacy here in New York envisioned their territory across the landscape as a longhouse, Late 18th century English poet William Blake looked at the land of England as the holy giant, Albion. Late 19th century British sculptor and metaphysical author Catherine Emma Maltwood was the Victorian-era discoverer of, on a smaller scale, the Glastonbury Zodiac, a figurative zoo of animal shapes that appear to be enacted upon the local topography by mostly natural features. So we are pleased to welcome, as our next guest, the mystic... (laughs) artist, author, and intuitive David Yarrow to Twilight on the Western Door. David, you're there. Yes, I'm here. Well, that's fantastic. It's our lucky afternoon. David, are you, uh, you ready for a little walk into the twilight? Uh, that was a very extraordinary introduction. I'll try and match it in some <laughs> small way, yeah. <laughs> well, humility is a good thing. Uh, the universe is constantly reminding me of uh, my own requirements for it. Um, well, let's begin with the spiritual anatomy of New York. David, um, I'd first like to ask you a question about the Great Lakes and Mother Ocean. Now, I understand that as you regard the upstate landscape from 
perchance the stars, you look down at it. Um, this might be the largest fresh watershed on Earth. Is, is that I, correct, David? I believe officially it is the largest fresh watershed on Earth, yeah. Mm-hmm. I, also, and that's, I think in terms of the volume of water that's coming out of it, it's uh, not really that big in terms of the ge- geographic region that it encompasses. In some places, the watershed boundary is only five to ten miles from the shore of one of the lakes. So it's a small geographic area, but a massive amount of water leaving the continent. Well, that's, that's extremely significant in a way because of its concentration. I mean, this is an enormous amount, if I'm reading you correctly, this is an enormous amount of water energy um, moving in roughly the same direction. Am I right? Yeah. Um, if you look at the planet, the North Pole is an open sea, the South Pole is a landmass. There's a basic polarity of the planet. And if you look from the North Pole down into North America, what you see is this large blob called Hudson Bay. And then the Finger Lakes is a smaller five-part blob that's below that. and So there's a, a definite arrangement of how water is showing up in North America. And the, the Great Lakes is, to me, uh, like a wellspring on the continent. It's a major place where water is rising up out of the earth and gathering in a basin. You know, I sort of knew this would happen, David, but uh, the, the merest phrase you utter gets me thinking of all other kinds of questions to ask, and I'm going to be out of order here, but David, in my um, experience of uh, a folklore and supernatural tradition, natural power tends to be associated um, with spiritual power. Would, would you say that there's some kind of connection here in New York State? Well, I guess I would say that spiritual power or spiritual law is universal. It's true for all time and all space. What we call natural law is true for this time and this place, which is planet Earth, and the geography and the geology and the, the physics and the chemistry of being embodied in this space. So that's one way I split between the spiritual world and the, the natural world. The spiritual world creates the natural world, so the two realms are intimately connected. Does that make sense? Um, yes. And furthermore... And then, then comes the issue of human law, and how do humans fit into this picture, and currently we're in, in a way of behaving where we become very arrogant and think that we can alter natural law to suit ourselves, and we can alter natural environments to suit ourselves, and we yet don't understand the, the holistic whole of how our actions are upsetting the balance of all things together. Well, I'm not so sure all of us disagree with you, David. Hey, um, while we're on the track of looking down on the New York State landscape, yes, um, a, a whole big chunk of all that water you're talking about uh, goes through Niagara Falls. Would you regard Niagara Falls as a metaphysically powerful site? Uh, well, any waterfall will be. Any break in the land where water falls is, it's, first of all, it's an energy generator. It's generating ions that float off and change weather. But in, in terms of understanding the life of the land, water is a primary force that creates the body of the land. It's also the fundamental element that is the first ingredient to cook up life. So water is always a key thing in understanding the the spiritual energy in the landscape. And so the way water behaves is a keystone of understanding the energy in the land. The thing that I find intriguing about Niagara Falls is that it's between Lake Erie and Ontario, and there's a little bit of sacred geometry and sacred alphabet that's encoded into this, where the E sound represents the the rectilinear space and the O sound represents circular space. And Niagara Falls is the connecting link between these two ways that energy works. Um, Let's let's backtrack just a little bit. Yeah. Um, It sounds like, David, you've got the theory, or and maybe it's not yours alone, that the sounds of words have some sort of a primal meaning. Uh, yeah, well, these days a lot of people are becoming aware of sacred geometry, about how there are certain 
basic shapes and and uh, uh, topographical topological operations that construct the space time reality that we're part of here. But there's also a sacred alphabet, and there is a precognitive level of energy and meaning that letters and sounds carry. And we use these shapes and these sounds to construct communications so that we can convey meaning and, and intelligence between each other. So these are the two tools we have. We have sacred geometry, we have sacred alphabet. So at a certain level below consciousness, just the sounds themselves are carrying messages about the structure of the reality we live in. Sure. Who's, whose theory is this? Where, where's this? Who, who's the pioneer? Who wrote this? Uh, I couldn't tell you. All I can tell you is that this was something that was downloaded into my brain by an angel. It's a uh, difficult thing to explain, but I was sitting with yeah. a Native American medicine man one day, and he was speaking about some things, and suddenly this whole understanding about sacred alphabet appeared in my brain. It took me about two weeks to unravel it and decode it and find a way to talk about it. Aha. Uh-huh. Okay. Well, all right. Um, yeah, it's, it's a strange thing, but consider that the first sound of the alphabet is a, is a vowel, which carries the, well, that's the power English, of vibration. That's the English alphabet. Yeah, yeah the English alphabet. Well, yeah, but not which all societies use the same alphabet. from a phonetic alphabet, Venetian alphabet. Well, okay, but I mean, Native American languages, for instance, are dramatically different. They may yeah. not even bother yeah. with an alphabet. Yep. Yeah. They so, emphasize different sounds and different uh, shapes, too. Okay. This so is the, the diversity of cultures and their way of developing this code to convey meaning into language. Sure. So do you have to come up with an entirely new code to deal with, for instance, the Iroquoian languages of upstate New York? Uh, I don't know much about that. I'm no expert. I, I've spent a little time around Native people, and I've heard them speak in their Native tongue. Sure. And it definitely carries a whole different uh, audible tone. They speak a lot deeper in their throat, for example. Sure. So I guess what I'm getting at is that this uh, theory about the sacred alphabet um, probably only applies to Western languages. That Not at you, all. Oh, no? The very, the very idea of language, to me, expresses the notion that when we speak, we are giving voice to the land itself. And so languages vary in large part because the geography and the topography, the land varies, and therefore that changes the resonance of the energy and the sound that people carry and convey. So it's a very profound intermixture of human beings and the environment that we don't take account of because we think we're separate from it. and We indented all this stuff ourselves intellectually. I knew I was going to get tested today, David. <laughs> All right, let's move on to another topic. Um, let's go back to the Great Lakes for a minute. Okay, let's do that. You mentioned this connection with spiritual anatomy in New York. So New York State has two connections to this watershed. One of them is obvious, which is the St. Lawrence River drains the last of the Great Lakes, Ontario, into the Atlantic Ocean. But what made New York State grow and become great was another connection, which is up the Hudson River north, to, and then west along the Mohawk River, and then the Mohawk River penetrates the mountains that block the interior of the continent, and actually does, the Mohawk River penetrates into the Great Lakes watershed, and comes within a few miles of the Great Lakes themselves. It curls up and goes up to Rome, New York, and not far from Rome is the beginning of Fish Creek, which goes into Oneida Lake, and the beginning of the Great Lakes watershed. So New York State has this dual gateway into the interior of North America. And this is no casual thing because it's the only break in the mountain between, the, uh, between Florida and uh, the, uh, the mouth of the St. Lawrence River. So it was the only way that human beings could easily access the interior and also remove goods and natural resources from the interior. That became the Erie Canal and then later the railroad. So, and so New York State was built on the economic power of this secondary pathway into the interior of the continent. Uh, it's a very remarkable thing, I get geographically. It. Yeah, well, that's Route 5. Route 5 goes right along there, yeah. Yeah, well, well, Route 5, um, it's, it's got a bunch of nicknames among them. It, well, for the benefit of the listeners who may not be from New York State, Route 5 is an east-west, uh, now it's much of it's a paved road, a highway, and it connects... 
most of the upstate cities. I mean, connects basically Buffalo, Albany, um, Auburn, uh, on, you know, just Rome. Um, it, it goes right across the state. And it's a very ancient footpath. It yeah. may have been created by the, by the animals at the end of the Ice Ages. And Route 5, at the time of uh, the uh, European arrival, had nicknames like the Iron Trail, because so much military hardware. I mean, if you're going to do any um, military adventuring, you are either going up and down the Hudson or you're going along Route 5. So it, I'm just finding, I'm sorry for the departure, David, but I'm finding it fascinating no that your observations about the geography and, and the use of uh, water fall right in with those of history. Well, I'll consider stepping out of the immediate geographic mindset and looking at it as geomancy. Route 5 runs from basically from Albany to Buffalo and connects the Hudson River with the, the, the Great Lakes. And how many Great Lakes are there? Aha. Uh-huh. Five. Five. And they go across, this Route 5 goes across the head of the, what are they called? The Finger Lakes. And there are how which many? Is the home of the Five Nations Confederacy. Oh, the coincidences are mounting. And the symbol of that is the white pine tree, which has five needles. And if that's not good enough to think that maybe there's more than coincidence here, the Indian whose face was on the buffalo nickel is buried at Onondaga Nation at the head of Onondaga Lake. And the nickel was a five cent piece. Aha. Uh-huh. Aha. Uh-huh. This seems to be an echo in here. <laughs> Number five popping up with extraordinary frequency and some odd connections. Well, we're certainly detecting a lot of them this, this evening. Now, one fragment you might not know about Route 5 is that the section between the Capitol in Albany and City Hall in Schenectady is the longest piece of straight highway in New York State. And it is the connecting link between the Hudson River and the Mohawk, or otherwise you've got to go up to the north and then come back down to the south. You've got to make a big loop-de-loop. Sure. It's, it's... So this is the shortcut between the Hudson and the Mohawk, and that, as you mentioned, was an ancient trackway for centuries before the white man ever came here. Well, probably and thousands it's, of years. It's, yeah, thousands of years. What I've discovered is that there are a series of sacred sites along Route 5 between... Absolutely. And they're equally spaced, it seemed like, about maybe every quarter to half a mile. I haven't actually precisely measured it. But there are earthworks and other unusual landscape features that are positioned along this piece of straight highway. Well, sacred fountains, um, council sites, even a lot of the the battles and massacres happened right along Route 5. Um, And, and, you know, you, you get a lot of ghost stories. Any town or village that's got Route 5 running through it. I always have fun. You know, I just know they're going to have a bunch of ghost stories right along Route 5. Yeah, well, part, partly I would say that's just because Route 5 runs down along the, the lowland. It runs in the river valley a lot. So it represents that low place, the hollow space that it runs through in the land. Well, that is certainly, certainly heavy. Are we ready to chat a little bit about the significance of the Adirondacks mountain range. Yeah, we could try that. There's a lot to say about that. What would you say in five minutes? Well, as I understand the Adirondacks, they are part of the oldest rocks of the planet. There were certain rocks that pushed up out of the ancient ocean of the earth and formed the first continent called Pangaea. And some of those first rocks are still embedded in other continents around the planet. I don't have this information clearly in my mind. It's probably 25 years old. But uh, the Adirondacks, for example, are part of uh, the same protrusion rocks that also are in Wales, which is a very profound and very ancient piece of Britain. No way. So it's intriguing to me that New York State is the only state in the United States which in its constitution, designates that certain lands shall be kept forever wild. And that specifically designates the Adirondack Preserve as such a place. And it's very appropriate because it is a very ancient and very sacred place. The energy that's up there is very extraordinary. It's been a place of inspiration for many uh, intellectual pioneers and leaders that have gone there and, and, and uh, 
reflected and, and gained insight. So to me, it's a, a very ancient landscape that carries a very pristine and uh, undisturbed sort of energy. I had heard that um, not many Native American people lived among the Adirondack Mountain Range. I'd heard a rumor that perhaps the... Uh, uh, yeah. Ir- yeah, Iroquois- first of all, there's, there's not any much decent soil up there, and the climate is terrible. So it's not a very easy place to live just because of the, the possibility of having access to table supplies of food in that kind of harsh environment. Sure. Okay. Um, it's also a very hard landscape. It's granite. And if you look around the planet, a lot of these granite massifs and uh, uh, other formations are generally sparsely inhabited. People like to live in the softer land or the lowlands. Sure. Okay. Another thing about the Adirondacks that's curious to me is that they are still growing. The geologists with laser studies from satellites report that the Adirondack Dome is still rising up out of the continent. And the current theory that I believe is put out is that this is rebound from the last glacial era 10, 12,000 years ago because the weight of the, the glacier ice had been removed from the continent, then the land is rebounding. But I'm not so sure about that. I'm, I have a different notion. But in any event, one thing that's clear to me is that what we now call the Allegheny Mountains, all that sedimentary rock to the south, a lot of that used to be the Adirondacks. And over the course of a couple billion years of planetary evolution, at least a billion, the Adirondacks have been ground down by water and ice and glaciers and other forces and distributed around with all that sedimentary rock. So the Red Adirondacks are an ancient stump of, of rock on the, on the continent. It's a very amazing place. And so I think that there's a connection between the Adirondack Mountains as this ancient stump of growing granite inside the planet and the Great Lakes as the largest fresh watershed on Earth. I think that the density of the earth is also connected to the the liquid water that comes out of the earth. And it's written right there in the geography of North America. The Adirondacks are, shall we say, upstream from the Great Lakes watershed. They're both expressions of an internal energy that is issuing up out of the earth. David, I I wanted to ask you about a concept that, that appears in your work and in your notes. In relevance to New York State, we, we've got the idea that somewhere in our landscape is what you would call the path of the green dragon. Uh-huh. Would you uh, uh, develop that a little bit for us? Uh, well, let's put the dragon aside for the moment and just deal with the path. Um, we already mentioned this connection between Albany and, and Buffalo, which is basically between the Hudson River and the St. Lawrence River, actually it's the, uh, the, the Niagara River at Niagara Falls. But if you continue that line to the west, it goes to the very heart of the Great Lakes. Uh, I think the town that's closest to the center line is Eau de Claire at the north end of the, the Detroit River, south end of Lake Huron. And if you extend that line the opposite direction and go straight to the east, it goes over the Berkshire Mountains, it goes across Massachusetts, goes over the highest mountain in Massachusetts, Mount Wachusett, and then goes through Boston and eventually goes out into the Atlantic just above the tip of Cape Cod. So, so the, the imaginary line of Route 5, if you just shot you it straight? If you extend it out west and east, it, it, okay. it becomes an even longer straight line that runs from Cape Cod through Niagara Falls to the heart of the Great Lakes. Hmm. So this, this link which runs south of Lake Ontario and north of the Finger Lakes and north of Lake Erie, is what, in an energetic perspective, connects the, the Mother Ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, with the heart of the Great Lakes, the largest freshwater shed on North America and probably on the whole planet. So, so in other words, you're looking at this line of Route 5, not mm-hmm. just Route 5 itself, but more or less the extension of it, as sort of a almost like an electric wire that's, that's charged uh, by what magnetic it Magnetic would be a better word than electric. Uh, what would I, I miss that? A magnetic channel. Ah. Uh, you've heard of the term ley line, undoubtedly. Come across it? Yeah, so what's to me is happening along this 
pathway I just described from Cape Cod to the heart of the Great Lakes is a bunch of ley lines are bundled together and braided into a chain that runs along this pathway. And this is probably one of the 10 or 12 most significant energy imprints on the North American continent. It's a very unusual configuration. Um, just having the Mohawk River enter the Hudson River like it does is extraordinary enough. But uh, they put all these points on a map together and the significance that they have. And this is a special energetic link in the anatomy of North America. There's probably, like I say, only a dozen other places on the continent that have the kind of bundle of energy that is focused in this little corridor. David, I think your defi definition of a ley line a little different than the one um, I would be using. I, I, uh -huh. I really, I, I like to use the bottom line definition of a lay is that it's a connector of ancient sacred power sites. It's a straight uh -huh. line. And the reason I use that as the baseline definition is because I can't prove anything else about it. I can definitely prove sure. to a determined sure. skeptic, I mean, to the mother of all disbelievers, that a ley line, that's many of them exist. When yeah. you, but many people believe that, that a ley line might have been an, or might still be an avenue of, of energy. And I think that's well, the definition you're using. Am I correct? Well, historically, you're correct. That's the original designation. That was why the Lord Ley Line was created. Was Alfred Watkins in the 1920s in Britain was studying ancient megalithic sites and discovered that they were aligned on exactly precisely straight lines that would run 10, 20, 30, even 40 miles across the British I, landscape, I which in his day was considered to be absurd. And he created the word ley line to describe these alignments of megalithic sites. Yeah, because then ley means fast metal. Forward, yeah, fast forward about 40 years, along comes the dowsers, who discover that they can detect some kind of energy that runs along these alignments of ancient megalithic sites. And so they hijack the word ley line to describe the energy and not the alignments. And so there is, as you, you point out, there's some confusion about exactly what it is we're talking about when we say ley lines. But that's a, that's a great uh, description you just, you just gave, my compliments. It's a historical fact of what happened. Somebody hijacked the word and it's now being used for another purpose. Sure, and I think for purposes of communication, you're using it that way too. Okay, yeah. David, we've got about two minutes before our, our break. Um, I'm, uh, I'm in a way sorry that I, uh, I took that detour into, uh, into the ley lines. Hey, can you think of any, any lays in upstate New York that might be uh, valid in my sense, that might be connectors of ancient power sites? Oh, dear. Well... Other than stretches of Route 5. Because I think this, the textbook definition of a lay right now, the one that the, uh, the lay hunters are using, and I don't mean the, uh, the dowsing lay hunters, but the, the, you know, the more professional ones is something like six sites inside 10 miles, I think. Yeah. On a well, fairly I, straight I mentioned line. the alignment along Route 5 between uh, the state capital in Albany and the city hall in Schenectady. That's very definitely a major ley line, a continental scale ley line that's running along there. And there are definitely a series of sites. I've tracked that line across the Hudson River to the east, and it runs along US 9 and 20 down into Columbia County, and then it crosses over into Massachusetts in the, in the Berkshires near where Interstate 90 crosses the Berkshires. Eventually, this line goes down to uh, the Connecticut River, at Meriden, which is where the Connecticut River bends from north to south, it turns slightly to the east and goes at a diagonal along this ley line into Long Island Sound. The ley line crosses Long Island Sound and goes out to Montauk Point, where the chief of the Montauk tribe instructed me to go investigate an earthwork in Fort Hill Cemetery, oddly enough. David, let me... an earthwork. It's on this ley line. So let's hang on to that thought. Major ley lines, yeah. Go Our ahead. credits are coming in. I'm going to ask you about Fort Hill in just a few minutes. For now, we're taking our mm. break from Twilight on the Western Door. Mason Winfield, oh. my very capable and interesting guest, David Yarrow, the mystic, the artist, the author, the polymath, talking about 
the spiritual anatomy of New York State. You're listening to Go Podcast Yourself Network. Let's go check it out. At gopodcastyourself.com. And we love you. Hi again, this is Mason Winfield, the host of Twilight on the Western Door, a program of discussions and interviews with cutting-edge experts on subjects of the spiritual, the supernatural, and the paranormal. Our guest this evening is David Yarrow, uh, generally associated with upstate New York. Uh, he he's, will forever be remembered for his uh, interpretations of the sacred landscapes in, in New York State. And uh, today, uh, David's a bit of a traveler, but we're happy to have him narrow down for our program this afternoon. David, are you back with us? I'm still here, yeah. Okay, well, that's, that answers my question in the affirmatively. Good. Um, David, I wanted to start out by asking you something about your, your picture of the spiritual power and resonance of the Finger Lakes. There's a lot of people that think that they together might be unusual and... Uh, they certainly got a lot of supernatural folklore of many types. How would you uh, how would you help us uh, get a picture of of the Finger Lakes? Well, geologically, the Finger Lakes are very unique. There's a very unusual set of geological factors that combine together to create these very long, very narrow, and very deep lakes. There's not too many like them on the planet, and no place that I know of are there an array of them like they are in upstate New York. Um, one way that I understand water in the landscape is that water carries energy. And when you form a lake, that means you have a container that's holding energy. And one way this shows up is uh, the way wind blows across the water of the lake creates waves. But in other more subtle and more macro scale ways, water in the landscape is a resonator that captures and holds energy and creates kind of like a drumbeat in the landscape. That makes sense? Uh, in general. In general. Uh, okay, so the Great Lakes <laughs> would be, therefore, a like kettle drums, very low frequency, large scale forces. But the Great Lakes are at the other extreme. The Great Lakes, because they're long, narrow, and deep, they carry a higher frequency, a very high frequency. And so it creates an environment in the Finger Lakes that's quite distinctive in the energetic aspects of it. And then add to the fact that there's a whole series of them arranged in the landscape. As a mathematician, when I look at the Finger Lakes, the first thing I think of is the normal distribution curve of statistics. Or what I would think of is the normal frequency spread in an uh, electromagnetic pulse. So I think of them as being like a musical instrument that is emitting specific frequencies of tone and energy in the landscape. And so taken together, the Finger Lakes to me represent a more or less a, a complete musical scale of energies. And looking at the land as a metaphysical instrument, then physical anatomy, to me this is like a gland or some type of functional piece of anatomy that's embedded in the land in upstate New York. It's a very, very unusual place. Yeah, well, the, you know, if, if somebody was really looking to write a good paranormal book that was regionally focused, very tightly regionally focused, the uh, Finger Lakes would be, would be perfect for it. You know, while we, we mentioned the, the Great Lakes put together there, I was going to ask you, David, have you ever heard of something they call the Great Lakes Triangle? No. Okay. Well, you've heard of the Bermuda Triangle. Sure. Okay. There's the, the thinking out there that the Great Lakes may be just as potent, in fact, a, a more, more powerful zone of uh, anomalies, supernaturalism, uh, UFO sightings. Yeah. 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 I, I guess the immediate way I would respond to that is that uh, 
Bermuda Triangle and its other cousins around the planet. There's actually 12 of those triangles around the Earth. Those are what I would call higher dimensional gateways or vortexes, if you like. And what's happening at the Great Lakes is not a connection between heaven and Earth, but my guess is that the Great Lakes represent a place between the inside of the Earth and the surface of the Earth. So it would probably be that kind of energetic triangle, but it has what I would call a reverse polarity to the one that we think of as the Bermuda Triangle. A reverse polarity. Can, do you, coming, you know, at, coming out of the Earth instead of coming down from the sky. Hmm. You know, while we're on the subject of these these vortexes that are, you mentioned that there are 12 of them yeah. around the world that are extremely powerful. Now, I, I seem to remember coming across, who was it that came up with the idea of the vile vortices? There was a, a paranormalist. Uh, I saw a TV show about that recently on the History Channel. I happen to not like that that terminology. I think it's too negative. Um, the, the guy that first discovered this pattern of 12 of these things was Charles Berlitz. Berlitz. Wasn't Ivan Sanderson, huh? I don't think so. I think Sanderson came after Berlitz. But sure. Berlitz was the first person I saw that published a map of these 12 things. And as soon as I saw his map, I said, well, that's an icosahedron in geometry. It has 12 vertexes. It has triangular faces. It's got five triangles at each vertex. Do you remember any of the other 12 besides the Bermuda Triangle and the Great Lakes Triangle? Uh, yeah, there's one uh, in the Gobi Desert. Uh, mm-hmm. There's one called the Devil Sea off of Japan, south and east of Japan. There's one somewhere down near the Falkland Islands. Basically, there's two rings of five of them that are slightly above and below the equator. I forget the exact number of degrees, but it's based on this... Uh, sacred, and that's geometry of the Icosahedron. So you have five at each of those latitudes, and then you have one at the North Pole, one at the South Pole. Sure, and a lot of them land on water, simply because the Earth is, the Earth's surface is mostly water, yeah. Or deserts, the Sahara Desert and the Gobi Desert being targets for both of these uh, vile vortexes that they've been termed. Yeah. All right, cool. These are definitely places where it's not smart for human beings to live. The energy in these places is too unstable. This is one of the things I've had to do often is had to go talk to people who, for example, want to put their house on top of a hill, which happens to be, shall we say, a dragon hill, and have to convince them in a rational uh, way to not build their house on this favorite spot they've picked out because it's going to make them crazy. It's going to disturb their lives. It's going to make their lives difficult. Because it's too unstable, there's too much strong energy at these places, and you want to live in a quiet place. Yeah, yeah, you want to put your temple yeah, someplace so you want to have same visions. Same thing with these Devil's Triangles and Bermuda Triangle places. They're not good places for human beings to try and live. What is a Dragon Hill? All right, um, this is a big subject. Um, the Chinese horoscope has 13 signs, not 12. The 13th sign is the dragon. The other 12 signs of the zodiac are creatures of the natural world, but the dragon is a celestial being that comes to us from heaven, and therefore is a whole different order of being. And this is confusing to a lot of people. Um, a lot of people, I've talked to people that seem to know a lot about sacred space and sacred geometry, and they think that snakes and dragons are the same thing, but it's, they're not. So, the simplest way I know to put it to people is that the dragon is the defensive or protective aspect of the mother. One way this appears in in uh, Scandinavia, one of their main creation stories describes how a great dragon was flying through the heaven and got tired and coiled up into a ball and went to sleep. And the earth formed on the surface of this sleeping dragon. So we're all riding on a sleeping dragon, and someday the dragon will awaken and continue its journey. So the earth, in a sense, represents the dragon. And this is true in uh, European mythology, because the dragons commonly live in the earth, and they guard uh, precious jewels and bodies of water that are inside the planet, and and gold and silver and all those precious metals are the domain of the dragon. 
Sure, and in the West, sometimes the dragon is something to be mastered, while in the East, it's something to sort of be worked with. Uh, yeah, you don't ever master the dragon. That's a big mistake right there. It's, <laughs> it's a far more powerful force. I think it was Merlin who was quoted in a Hollywood movie as saying, the dragon, a creature of such incredible scale that if you were to see it all at once, it would burn you to cinders. All right. uh, there's some things that are a little big to fit inside our brain. If we try and think of them too seriously, our brain might overheat. Sure. Well, we don't this want is, that happening to our listeners here, because I think we're getting off uh, off track. Well, I speak as someone that, that uh, had a near-death experience, and I know that the universe is far busy, bigger than space and time and the physical world that we think we inhabit. Sure. The attention and, span of our listeners will not be quite so. Um, yeah. Hey, um, if I could steer us back to yes, back to the uh, the uh, the uh, spiritual landscape of of the state, I um, I'm curious to to know uh, what you know about the ancient the earthwork temples of upstate New York. Uh, I know yeah, you, yeah. yeah. Help us out there. Yeah, there's actually tens of thousands of these things all over North America. There was a book by a man in uh, early 1800s in Western New York who, who uh, investigated and, and uh, uh, cataloged the Indian mounds of Western New York. And he, he had well over 100 of them in his, his document that he probably wrote. Sure. Uh, could uh, that have been... The first, squ- uh, pardon me, do you have his name? I mean, it might have been Larkin, uh, Squire, no Beecham. I remember it was Livingston County was the primary place where he's he doing his surveys. But mm. it's, it's his... 30, 40 year old information in my brain. Um, but but uh, the first significant Indian mound I discovered in upstate New York was uh, in a place called Pumpkin Hollow, a little south and west of Syracuse. It's a one mile wide glacial outwash valley, and it's totally flat across the bottom of this valley over a mile, except for this one 70 foot earthwork that somebody put there, and it's right at the energetic center where you have a vortex of ley lines and you have a massive water column rising under it. So somebody put that little pile of dirt right at the sacred site in the middle of this mile-wide valley. And then I discovered my second one was 30 miles west of there, in the city of Auburn, is Fort Hill Cemetery. Oh, yeah. Very powerful. Fort Hill refers to a massive earthwork structure that's the highest point in the city of Auburn. It's the only place in the city of Auburn you can see a Wasco Lake, a Finger Lake. And it... uh, is officially the northeasternmost of any of the so-called Indian mounds in North America. It's, there's actually a sign on the street that speaks about Fort Hill as being a, a man-made earthwork. You know, um, it's not a mound. It's actually a complex of probably a so, dozen mounds that are scattered over easily about 30 acres of the landscape there. But the principal area that's preserved within the cemetery consists of about six mounds that are interlinked in some kind of geometric design. And it's, um, it was turned into a fort by the Iroquoian society near there, which I think might have well, been the Cayuga? They lived, yeah, the Cayuga had a village there. It was one of their principal villages on top of the mound. Um, it's a remarkable place to live. Because yeah. It's very carefully terraced. It's one of the most elaborate pieces of mound building that I've seen in the Northeast. It's uh, got spirals on it. It's got very elaborate terracing. It's got little raised circles of ground that are about 25 feet in diameter and only about 18 inches high. And the whole thing is laid out in a pattern that only a dowser would understand. That place was designed to match the subtle energy of the land in that site. It's actually set up as a giant spiral that's a good mile in diameter. Yeah, we're talking about the Fort Hill Cemetery in Auburn. Um, I found Fort Hill fascinating myself yeah. for uh, a, a while, and I'm fascinated to talk to someone else who uh, has uh, taken it a, a, a few steps further. David, you've yeah, ever... The crows like it, too. I've seen thousands of crows in Fort Hill Cemetery walking around on the ground. Well, you know, I was going to ask you about that. Do you, do you have any idea what draws them there? I... I understand that crows are very unusual birds. Um, I first realized this many years ago. I was 
walking down the street in Syracuse, and I looked up and saw some crows flying over, and then it, I stopped and just stared because I realized they were flying along head to tail in a single file. And I stood there and watched as over 200 crows flew over my head in single file. And I realized for the first time in my life that these birds are intelligent and they're up to something. Hmm. They're not playing around. They're doing something intelligent here. And in my years of respecting crows and paying attention to them, I now understand that they contain a bit of alchemy. The story in many cultures, native cultures, is about how the white eagle, by some magical means, was turned into the black bird. That's an alchemical transmutation. And the bird, the, the, the crow carries this. So the crow carries sacred knowledge. And it uses that knowledge. And I've seen crows in many parts of the country, all out in the Midwest and here in the Northeast, gather at sacred sites at sacred times of the year and do ceremonies. They get down on the ground, they walk around, and they're doing something. Well, you know, the, is, cr the crow has been thought of a prophetic bird, I mean, in, in many yeah. world societies. It hasn't... Yeah. Uh, yeah. So you're not alone in, in thinking that. Oh, that is yeah. fascinating. I understand that the crows migrate, I, I guess, at two different times of the year. They have a particular fascination with Fort Hill in uh, Fort Hill yeah. Cemetery in Auburn. Had, yeah. Do you know the two days of the year that they, they basically, I mean, thousands, hundreds of thousands, they land there. There's just... Everything is just tormented with crows. Do you, do you know yeah, the, the um, times of year they do that? I haven't been around Fort Hill enough to collect any observation. The first time I noticed this, all I can tell you is that sometime in November, the sacred date at that point would be November 1st is All Saints Day or, or a Halloween as we call it in the West. But that's the halfway point between summer solstice and, and uh, or no, fall equinox and winter solstice. Yeah, the cross-quarter day. Yeah. Cool stuff. I've seen uh, crows in Syracuse gather at a sacred site on the south side of Syracuse at the winter solstice. And again, there'd be hundreds of crows, probably, I couldn't tell it was dark, but uh, easily there was hundreds of crows, and they were walking around on the ground like it was nobody's business. Um, what sacred site do you remember that may have been? It's in uh, Hiawatha Park. Uh-huh. Uh, or no, it's in, uh, sorry, it's in Onondaga Lake next to Hiawatha Lake. I see that right. It's Onondaga Park, next to Hiawatha Lake. Uh, it's at the end of Summit Avenue. If you go straight up Summit Avenue from South Avenue, it ends just short of Onondaga Park, and if you were to go straight, you would go over the top of this little earthwork. It's I'm, a very diminutive thing. It's only about 40 feet high. Well, it, it was probably bigger at one point in time. These things tend to, tend to settle. You well, know, actually, I, I think it was, it's actually an observation platform. I think what they were doing at this one site was they were monitoring the sunrise on the east side of Onondaga Valley. They could monitor the sun and track its movement from north to south and use it as a, a calendar site to track the movement of time. Once you can track the movement of sun on the horizon line and markets, then you can track the moon, which takes 80 years to complete its cycle, and then you can predict eclipses from a site like that. Wow. That's my theory, anyway. That this was put there a few thousand years ago by some people as an astronomical observation platform. Sure. You got any theories on who those folks were? What, what would we call the society? Mound builders, uh, Adena, Hopewell, or influenced there, by those societies? Uh, all the names you mentioned are tribes that were in existence in the last one or two thousand years. And there are a lot of earthwork structures in North America that were built a thousand years ago by the Adena and Hopewell people. But there are a whole other class of these earthworks which are more ancient that were built probably more like three or 4,000 years ago. And uh, these have not been effectively studied and classified. The archaeology has sort of been ignoring these earthwork structures and, and pretending they don't really exist and haven't don't represent some unknown mystery in the history of America. I, literally, we know there's ten to thousands of these earthworks all the way up into New Brunswick and Newfoundland and Nova Scotia. I agree with you uh, heartily, David, and I, I have to point out that probably the reason we're able to ignore these things is because they 
you know, once they're no longer tended by the society, and we're talking of mounds and ring forts and basically monuments that are made out of nothing but the natural earth, they yeah. they tend to subside over time. They unless they're maintained, they tend to to shrink and and the average person can't tell just by looking what is a a man-made earthwork and what's just a small feature on the landscape. We've got a couple of those in, in yeah. Erie County, and uh, you, you know yeah. that they are man-made, and, and 500 years after the last person has yeah. tended them, you can't tell by looking. They tend to be batteries for supernatural folklore. Um, yeah. Things pile up there. Well, as a dowser, I know that these a lot of these mounds are positioned at power spots in the land where you have vortexes and, and uh, blind domes or, or uh, springs of water that are rising up from inside the earth. And uh, a lot of these sites, like the one in Fort Hill, have actually been shaped to match the subtle energy anatomy of the land at these places. And the Hopewell didn't do these. These are ones that were done at an earlier time. And that's one way that I discriminate them is that a lot of the more recent earthworks by the Hopewell and Adena people are sort of randomly placed in the landscape, but these ancient ones are strategically placed at power points and major lay configurations and other uh, significant pieces of the subtle energy landscape. Well, it's it's impossible well, to date a hunk of dirt. I mean, yeah, well, the earth is I mean, the same age anywhere, so I'm I'm not surprised that the, the professionals would would have a little bit of uh, dispute about the age of these things. But on the other hand, there have been earthworks found in the uh, Mississippi River Valley that certainly are three to 4,000 years old. They're oh, yeah. utterly remarkable. Yeah. And all along the, the Gulf Coast and up along the Appalachians, there, these things are everywhere. When you get up into New England, they didn't have a lot of dirt. So what you find more in New England is you find placed stones. They're called dolmens or tipping rocks or balance rocks and other sorts of rocks that have been not placed by nature but deliberately placed by human intention. Now, one one uh, thing we should probably kick around here, um, as I said, it's very clear to me that a lot of these earthworks, particularly the ones that are clearly the more ancient ones, were established by people that knew how to douse and, and detect the subtle energy of the land, which currently people are totally dumb to. There's only a few people like myself that have bothered to become dowsers, and then as dowsers use it to explore the subtle energy of the land itself. It's a rather lonely profession, but I've stuck <laughs> at it for about 40 years. And I know that we have a left brain that we're currently trapped in in Western culture. It's the intellectual rational, analytical t brain. But we have another brain called the right brain, which is the artistic, intuitive, and holistic brain. And whoever built these mounds was operating out of their holistic right hemisphere consciousness, which we don't operate in today. So we are blind well, and insensitive to the, the subtle energies that are responsible for the placement and construction of a lot of these sites. Well, what some, I, some people what do I, operate in their in their right brain, and they're, they're not valued much by society as a rule. Yeah, yeah. I mean, their taxes, yeah. they're, they're, every bill they, they well, pay is late. I mean, I'm, I'm one who does a lot of that. <laughs> let's be blunt here. What I do, locating wells for people, is called water witching. And that designates it as a dark, negative, and derogatory thing that you probably don't want to mess around with. Now, I insist that every body is a water body, and every living creature knows how to find water. Sure. And human beings have the best piece of equipment for detecting and finding water. What surprises me is not that we have this equipment. What startles me is how much cultural energy has been invested in forbidding human beings from accessing this part of their awareness, their consciousness, and their brain. We have a culture which has put a big lock and key on these intuitive faculties. And this is a problem that's, that's plaguing our culture today. Yeah, it's, it's hard to see where that, uh, that judgmental system came from. You know, you, yeah. you, you look at, I, I'd be the first to agree with you that there's some kind of a dichotomy in, uh, in Western man. Um, I think we, we, we really do need to, to open up to other 
other influences, and uh, um, I, I truly thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. Hey. Well, this is part of the thing with the Adirondack. Because those rocks are so old, because they are plugged into the deep layers of the planet as part of this granite extrusion from the Earth, the energy in the Adirondacks, the magnetic field and other energetic forces that are in that mountain range is very unique, and no wonder people go there and feel expanded and enlightened and energized. It's, it's part of the land itself up there. Or you could just go visit a local earthwork where there is the proper field of energy, the proper vortex of heavens and earth forces, and you could meditate in those places and achieve a similar measure of inspiration and spiritual attunement. You know, you brought up a very interesting point. I get uh, people talking to me all the time in my profession as a an author of uh, supernatural f collections of folklore. They go, you know, they'll, they'll, or I'll meet them on tours and stuff. They go, Mace, Mace, uh, where do I go to see a ghost? I really want to see a ghost on Halloween. I want to go someplace, see a ghost. And I kind of go, well, you know. Go to a, go to a battleground. <laughs> well, I usually <laughs> tell them that killed. there's no place you can go where yeah. you're guaranteed to see anything supernatural. If it was that easy, science would believe in it. But I usually, I don't send them to a famous haunted house. I usually say, look, find an ancient temple. Find a sacred yeah. site. I think yeah. a battlefield's a good theory, too. Um, and be, because, you know, it's one, of the, it's one of the generalities. I mean, the reason a lot of our uh, great religious sites were built was so that people could see things there. They could, they could get closer to their gods or the elders, or whatever it is they're yeah, trying to find. Yeah. Well, to me, the most simple function of a temple is to keep heaven and earth united and in harmony. If you want to call it accessing God or whatever, that's fine, but it's that union of heaven and earth is necessary for the stability of life. Temples were places where people knew this is where you could make those connections happen, and they went there and made them happen, and, and by ceremony, they were able to strengthen them and enhance them. But again, this is lost up. In French, for example, the person who finds you the source of water is called the sorcerer. So once again, we find out that people that tap into these intuitive modes of interacting with the earth and with the land are cast out to the edges of society and considered to be witches, sorcerers, and other uh, undesirable characters. David, I, I had no idea which direction we were going to go today, and I can tell you honestly that I've been fascinated by it. We've got about a minute and a half. Uh, is there anything you'd like to say to sort of uh, help us out, summarize your position? Yeah. Um, I'll leave you with this thought. To me, the most important thing that's happening on our planet, to our planet right now, is not climate change, although I consider that to be a state of emergency right now. More important than that to me is the fact that the North Magnetic Pole is no longer in North America. As of the year 2000, according to the Canadian Geophysical Union website, whose scientists, on behalf of the world scientists, go visit, locate, measure, and map the North Magnetic Pole routinely every few years, they state on their website that in the year 2000, the North Magnetic Pole, for the first time in human memory, left North America and is headed across the Arctic Sea at a high rate of speed in a straight line. It's been traveling in that straight line for 120 years. And since it left North America in the year 2000, it had accelerated from its normal five kilometers per year. It's now moving at over eight, I'm sorry, over 40 kilometers per year. It's accelerated by a factor of eight. What this means is that in 40 to 60 years, if nothing changes and the pattern of the last 120 years continues, the North Magnetic Pole will be in Siberia, not in North America. And we don't know what this is going to do to life on Earth. We have only limited information about the impact of the magnetic field of the planet on biological or ecological systems here. But based on what we do know, what I've learned, one thing I can assure you is that in two more generations, children are going to be born who are imprinted and operating out of their right brain more than people have for centuries. And they're not going to think like people did in the 20th century. And they're not going to behave like people did in the 20th century. And they're going to build a different kind of world than they did in the 20th century. Well, the I fact can... that the magnetic field of the Earth is shifting is a signal that the consciousness of human beings is also going through a major upheaval and transformation right now.
Thank you, David. I can think of a few things about the 20th century that none of us are going to miss. For now, I thank our gifted and talented guest, David Yarrow. Um, I thank you for the good work you're doing in the world. I really really appreciate you spending your time with us. I hear our very mysterious and entrancing closing credits fading in, for which we thank the Afro-Celt Sound System, a Scottish-African fusion band that we admire so much. Oh, They're, Scottish, it's say. Oh, yeah. We're done, David. Thank you. Right. Their music Bye-bye. sounds like what Thank we you. mean. <laughs> Thank you for talking about this. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll meet again, good friend. Till later. Very good. Bye-bye. We thank the Afro-Celt Sound System for their work, as we thank Chris Starr, Carolyn Smith, and the whole GPY radio that is the Go Podcast Yourself Network. Most of all, we thank our revered guest, David Yarrow. You can contact David for speaking events uh, through his own website, which is www.dyarrow.org. Um, you can contact him through us. We'll put you in touch with him. He'd, he'd make a good speaker. Otherwise, until we meet again, shine in that light whose smile kindles the universe. Work every day to make this a better world. Amen. Amen.